He's called me. I'm sure he's so proud of me. He's counting on me. How could I have let him down? All of this going through Peter's mind and his heart. He's a failure. But thank God that's not the end of the story. Amen? And I'm thankful that when we fail, yes, we do, and we falter, thank God that's not the end of the story. You see, Satan had a temporary victory in Peter's life. But our great God in mercy and grace didn't give up on Peter. And he even used Peter's failure to help mature Peter to greater service. And I believe that is with us also. If when we fail, if we look to God with all of our hearts after we have failed, I believe God can take our defeats, our failures, our shameful acts as they are, that it's possible to turn it around and be used of God even in a greater way. Now, I'm not condoning sin, but remember this, none of our failures of sin justifies ever sinning. Not even a little. Sin is sin. And sin grieves the heart of God when we do sin. Disobedience always is sinful and wrong. And when we sin, we will pay a heavy price if we don't repent. But in spite of how awful sin is, our great God is a great and gracious God. And God did not give up on Peter. And he doesn't give up on us and throw us away. If we get up and wipe the dust off and follow him, he can use us to help other people who have failed in similar ways. I believe after studying the scriptures for myself that God knows at times we will fail, we will fall. And God doesn't stop us. I believe there's a reason. I believe God allows us in order for us to face our failures so that we might get it through our hard heads, that we might learn that in our walk with him, we have to trust him totally and completely. It states there in Luke twenty-two thirty-one. 31, he says in the middle of that verse there, uh, he says, Satan hath desired to have you. Satan hates God and he hates God's children. He wants to destroy them. But in that verse, there's a comforting truth that's showing us something, that Jesus knew what Satan wanted to do to Peter, and he knew what Peter would do. He knew Peter would fail, but Jesus didn't quit on Peter. He says in that verse 32, he says, When thou art converted, when you come to your senses and you realize you have sin, I want you to step up, stand up, repent, and get back right with me. You see, Jesus had more faith in Peter than Peter had in Jesus, didn't he? Isn't that amazing? They, they tell us a bone that is broken often becomes stronger after it's healed. Like Peter, we often fail God. We fall, and then we fall, and then we fall again throughout our life. And we're covered with the muck of sin and shame. We feel so defeated. But God has given, has not given up on us. And through his grace, we can rise up and in gratitude for what he is doing and forgiving us and allowing us to get back in the race, out of gratitude, we can become stronger than ever before. It states this in Psalm 37, 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. And then he says, though he fall." He shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his right hand. Thank God he's there to pick us up. You see, a great truth and lesson, lesson is this here. Our failure, our falling into sin causes us to limp. And that's a good thing. We limp like Jacob. And that limp is a constant reminder, not only to us, but other people, to have these godly things in our life so that it will keep us back from failing again. So we do limp, but that limp reminds me of the awfulness of sin. It reminds me of how it hurts God, but also it reminds me of the wonderful grace of God. And so it can make you stronger as a result of that. 
We can't operate within our pride, our self-sufficiency, and the uh, weakness of our flesh. And I believe by falling on our faces, <clears throat> we are forced at that moment to admit, to learn that without the Lord's help and strength, we all are capable of any sin. Amen? Excuse me. <clears throat> We're all capable of any sin. And what sin are we capable of? Sometimes read Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21 sometime. We will fall. You see, our old nature, it's there. And our old nature is like a snake that's all coiled up, just waiting for his opportunity to strike and cause us to sin. <laughs> our own fallenness and sinfulness, our old nature, yells out to us all the time. It wants control of our life. And it's only by God's grace when we cry out to God. And then he helps us. Can we say no to our flesh and yes to the Spirit of God? That's the only way it's possible to keep our old nature in check and have victory in our life. As I read the scriptures, I've often noticed that God often uses broken people. And he uses them to accomplish something great. So I say to you who have fallen in the sin, it doesn't have to be the end in God's love and God's use of you. Even in our worst painful moments, our lowest point of our awful sin, in the midst of our deepest failures, somehow God in grace, those things can play a big part in God's plans for us. I think of Chuck Coson, went to prison. But God used that, and he has a tremendous ministry to prisons today. I think of Tim Lee, who was running from God. And on that explosion that blew his legs off in Vietnam, God showed him he couldn't outrun him. And he has used that for the benefit to train other people who have been running from the call of God up on their life. It's amazing. And then I think not only of Tim and that, I think of uh, Don Sink and uh, Don Druggie. But now today he has a home for these fellas that come out of jail, no place to go. They need to be built up in faith and so on, or even on drugs, whatever it might be. He has his place and he's ministering, putting the word of God in these fellows' hearts. His sin was awful. He felt great, but God raised him up and now he has a great ministry. Now think about it. If you have doubts about that, just call up the Bible row of its heroes and so on. Adam and Eve. They were sinless, but they ate the forbidden fruit and they sinned and passed that up on all people. Noah got drunk and one of his sons saw his nakedness. Lot got drunk and committed incest. Abraham and Isaac lied. Jacob was a deceiver. Moses was a murderer. Rahab was a harlot. <laughs> Judah was immoral. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Samson was immoral. Saul, who became Paul, he was a persecutor, unkind, and even a murderer himself. And then we have Peter here. Peter the denier, Peter, Peter the cursor. Isn't that amazing? And Peter, in his failure, he lost some things. He lost his vainness, his pride, his self-sufficiency, his impulsiveness without thinking, his unreliability and lack of faith. When he fell, he couldn't stand on those things any longer. He lost them. And when he was converted, Peter gained humility, gratitude, gratefulness for God's love, faith, and biblical courage, a willingness to remember his failure in order to show others grace to help them get back up. Through Peter's failure... Peter gained the power of God in his life. That when the first time he preached, 3,000 souls came to Christ the Messiah. Even after his failure. And it's a fact. If we knew the naked truth, the naked truth about everybody here at Grace Point this morning, we'd all run out the doors right now. <laughs> That's just a fact. Let's just be honest 
and truthful. And let's face it, we're all failures at times. We all are broken people because of sin. Some people just hide it better than others. We all have some fallings in our life, including me. I don't care who we are in this building this morning. And I remind myself, you that are without sin, ye cast the first stone. And nobody can cast that. And so in my conclusion this morning, very, very simple. There are some lessons. The first lesson is the value and need of humility. Understand something. We're not as hot as we think we are. Nobody's beyond temptation. And we need God more than anything and all that he has for us to be able to stand and not fail. But we need the value of humility. God, I can't live this life without you. Secondly, we need patience with other believers. Too often when a brother or sister falters or fails, too many Christians are there surprised, disappointed, and too often condemning. They like to point and look down on people who have faltered. Let me just remind you again, on our best day, we still sin. And I believe God, when people fail within the church, we need to cut them a little slack. And we need to show something that we received ourselves from God, forgiveness and grace. And God will honor us for doing that. And the third lesson is this here, the amazing, undeserving grace of God. None of us deserve that, okay? Peter would say, listen, you aren't worthy, but God loves you anyway. And I say to you this morning, if not for grace. 1 Corinthians 10, 15, the first part of that verse, that by the grace of God, I am what I am. If it were not for God's grace, we all would fail and fail and fail. So we come to the point, it's happened. My flesh has given in. I haven't been able to stand on my own. I didn't lean and put the things of God into my life like I should have. I've miserably failed. I've sinned. Satan's hit me. How do I proceed? Well, understand this. You can't go back. You see, you can't relive and undo what you've done. It's happened. Admit it, repent of it, and ask God for grace. Secondly, you can't stay where you are. You see, if you stay in the same place, even though God's forgiven you and he wants to show you grace, you will fall back and commit the very same sin again if you just stay there. The only recourse we have is we must go forward. I have to go forward for my sake. I have to go forward for my loved one's sake. But above all, I have to go and go forward for God's honor and God's sake. It's time to stop thinking so selfishly and start thinking about who we represent. Amen? We represent the King of kings and Lord of lords. And by God's grace, and it's available, he says that. He says this, I'll be there for you. Just take one step at a time, one day at a time. I'll be there for you. James 4, 6 or 8 says this, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud. You say, ah, you know I've sinned, but it's not that bad. You don't get it. But giveth grace unto the humble. God, it's me standing in the need of prayer. It's nobody else that's caused this. I don't blame anybody. I'm not making any excuses. God, I have sinned. My sin is ever before me, God. That's what David said. And then submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and what? Because now God's with you. And then he says this, the last verse there, draw nigh to God. Start getting close to him. Put him in your life and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. It's available for you. Peter says this, listen, okay, you've fallen short. You've let the Lord down, yourself down, you've sinned. But don't despair. God still loves you. Peter says this to us today. If God can forgive me, God can forgive anyone. That's the way Peter felt. And understand 
the graciousness of an opportunity that God offers those who have failed. You see, when we fail in this world, this world could care less about us. This world, you know what it does with us when we fail? When they criticize and the media is on somebody finally and they just completely tear them apart, they just walk away, they just throw them away. But God doesn't throw us away. God takes us to himself and strokes us, pours some oil in our wounds and that. He said, don't you understand how much I love you? Don't you understand how much I care for you? You can do this. You can make it. Now get up there and I'll be with you, but it's time to stand and keep going forward. That's the God we have. And regardless of what we have done in our life, thank God that there is a God of grace. And it's there for you today. So I just say, get up. Wipe the dust off. Cry out to God. Repentant, of course. But say, God, I need your grace. And he'll be there for you. Father, we love you today. Thank you for grace. If it were not for grace, none of us would be sitting here today. And so, Lord, I just pray that as a Christian, that I would be so excited that I have a message that regardless of what a person has done in their life, I can tell them the good news, grace, and it's true. And so, God, I just pray that regardless of what sin I'm in, regardless of how I failed or fallen, that the day I'm deciding, God, it's you all the way with you because I love you and because I'm grateful for your grace. Here I am. Use me. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope that this message really challenged you and that you serve Christ because you have freedom and liberty and you choose to do that because you love him and you have a heart of gratitude. And by the way, why don't you come and visit with us? Our services are on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, Sunday night at 5 o'clock, and then Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. Uh, we have classes for everybody from young to old, and uh, our church is a dispensational church. I mean, uh, we teach rightly dividing the word of truth. And right now on Wednesday nights, I'm going through Galatians, Sunday nights through Ephesians. And why don't you come and learn the word of God with us? And I promise you it'll be exciting when you begin to do that. Until next week, God bless you. Okay. Old man, doesn't he? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I'm not going there. Okay, good to have you. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'll be there in just a little bit. And uh, I want to talk about what... What keeps me going on for Christ and trying to do what's right? And I think a lot of times what we do, uh, we get weary, we get tired in this battle, don't we? And it rages a lot of times. And it's real. And uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but a lot of times we sure think we do. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm grateful uh, that there's a motivation that encourages me in my life to get right back in the race and do what God wants me to do. Uh, today we see a lot of people turning, uh, you know, by the wayside, turning away from the Lord, falling into sin, becoming a castaway. I remember when I was a student at Tennessee Temple, there are a lot of fellows that started, but a lot of fellows didn't make it all the way to the end. They just threw in the towel. Sometimes people quit because of priorities. Other things become more important to them, and they would rather do those things. Some people quit because of pleasure. Uh, the lights, the temptations, the attractions of the world. You know, we're like Demas who forsook Paul for the cares of this world. Some people quit because of pressure, because it is a battle. It's very, very difficult at times, just like Peter. You know, pressure, he wanted to be accepted with the group at that time. Some people quit because of their old partner. And what I mean by that, not your wife, fellas. I don't mean that, okay? But your old flesh. And that old flesh is with us until we die. 
And that's why Paul said, the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, that's exactly what I do too much of the time. And so we have that old partner. But also some people quit just because they're phonies. Uh, you know, they went out from us because they were not of us, like Judas. And so there are many reasons why people quit running their race for Christ after they become a child of God. And by the way, before I go any further, let me just say, I'm trying to challenge Christians today, and I want you to realize something, that Christ died for your sins, he was buried, he rose again the third day, that's called the gospel. And if you will put your faith in who Christ is, the Son of God, and his finished work, he died for you, he was buried, he rose again, if you put your faith in that gospel with your heart, God says he'll save you today. Now, the majority of us have done that in our hearts and lives, haven't we? We've already done that, and so now we're in this race. God says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, one of my favorite verses. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. God wants us to keep on going for him. And then he states this. My professor used to quote to me this every day in summer school, Galatians 6, 9. He would say, gentlemen, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And so God wants us to keep on going. There has to be a reason for us to keep on going, though, when the battle is raging and we're weary and we're tired. We don't think we're going to make it. Back in the age of between 200 and 300 uh, B.C., or A.D., I'm sorry, A.D., uh, there was a real controversy. A guy by the name of Arius came up, and he was trying to take away from the deity of Jesus Christ that he was not God. And uh, one fellow stood up against him by the name of Athanasius. And Athanasius' friends said, listen, if you stand up against this guy, then the world's against you. Then Athanasius said, well, it is I, Athanasius, then, against the world. And he stood for the deity of Christ, and he won the day. Thank God he was willing to stay at it and keep going. In the early church, a lot of persecution came because of Diocletian. And he would command people, they would have to bow and say, Caesar is Lord. But when the believer came across, many of them, they would say, Jesus is Lord. They would not bow to that. And when, he, when they would do that, they would immediately take him to the Colosseum for the lions, for entertainment, to be burned at the stake and things like that. You can go into the catacombs there uh, under Rome there, the Colosseum there. And you'll see on the walls, those people before they were marked out for the entertainment to be martyred for their faith, verses on the walls there of their faith in Christ. And you ask the question, what motivated them to remain faithful? What motivated Paul? Uh, what motivated the 50 million plus that were martyred for their faith by the Roman Catholic Church? Believers who believe you didn't have to belong to the Rome church, be water baptized and works for salvation, but saved by grace. Over 50 million plus martyred for their faith. What kept them going? Today, difficulties come, yet there are some people, they have the ability to stay in there and they don't quit. Why is that? I believe 2 Corinthians 5.14. Uh, if I had a second life verse, it would be this one. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says this here. For the love of Christ constraineth us. I uh, just want to stop there. The love of Christ constraineth us, okay? That's a great word right there. Uh, you see, God's love causes me to love him. And, you know, you step back and you ask yourself sometimes, why do you love Christ so much? Well, he listens to me. <laughs> when nobody else will listen to me, he does. I remember early in my Christian walk, Carol and I went to the hospital to visit her grandmother, and uh, she was in a lot of pain, and she said she called the nurse, and the nurse wouldn't come, and so we had a word of prayer for her, and as soon as we got done praying, bam, the door opened up, and the nurse came in and said, I thought you might be in some pain, and had some pain medication for her. And God taught me something. He listens to us, and I'm grateful for that. Even this past week, Carol and some of the ladies really been praying for my, gran uh, my granddaughter about a circumstance and situation, and it came to pass. So I'm grateful he listens to me. Not only that, he lifts me up. Uh, he tries to encourage me in salvation, uh, grace, in life, grace. You know, it's easy to throw in the towel sometimes, isn't it? But God comes along and he tries to encourage our hands, our feeble hands, and lift them up. Just like Moses had Aaron and Hur to lift his hands up for encouragement. Aren't you grateful we have a God who comes alongside you 
and he lifts you up too. Not only that, he loosens me. And what I mean by that, he took me out of the pit and he set me up on a rock and he set me free. Set me free from sin's position of being in Adam in sin on my way to hell. Sin's practice, I don't have to live like I used to. And sin's prospect. One day when I drop this old nature and I go to heaven, I won't have to worry about sin anymore. I'm looking forward to that day. Something else, he leads me. He leads me beside still waters. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Amen? Amen. I like the old song. The title is, Jesus led me all the way. I look back and I see how God called me and he led me to go to Bible college at Tennessee Temple. And he gave me my verses and so on. I, I remember how up in Carol's, bathroom there on her mom and dad's house at 2022 East Raymond Street, how God visited me in that old bathroom there and showed me he wanted me to start a church called Emmanuel. And by the way, let me just say, God has also led me to start this church here with some other people. And as I look back, all I can say is it's God. It has to be of God. I thank God for Grace Point now. Not only that, he labors for me. God uh, he works for me each day of my life by presenting me. Now he's my intercessor, and one day he will present me faultless. Not only that, he's pardoning me. Every time the devil tries to accuse me of what I've done wrong, my sin, Christ steps up and he says, I died for Jim Devaney. And boy, what a blessing. He's my defense eternity in glory. Not only that, he's purifying me. It's God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. He's protecting me. All of us can step back and say he's placed a hedge about us at times in our life that we are in a fortress in the cleft of the rock. As he said to the kingdom church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church and likewise for the body, and I'm in the church. I'm grateful. I remember Kurt Davis told me, my father-in-law said one time, I've never forgotten it, he says, man is immortal while he's in the will of God. Amen? And I am grateful that he protects me. He also promises me. He says, Jim, I have over 3,000 promises just for you in the Word of God just to help you, you can claim for your life. And then also, not only that, he's preserving me. We are kept by the power of God. Those he foreknew, he predestinated. And those he predestinated, he called. And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he glorified. Already I am a finished product in the plan and purpose of Almighty God. And I don't know about you, but he's preserving me so that one day I will arrive home in heaven. That's for every child of God. And not only that, he's permitting me to experience the difficulties of life. There's a reason for that. He's trying to work all these things, whether they're good or bad, that we might be conformed to the image of his Son. All of these trials that we go through, they're, they're not by accident. God has a purpose, and he's molding, and he's making us. And somebody states, okay, you keep on going. What's your motivation? The last one would be, he loves me. And then I say, me? <laughs> he loves me. And wonderful thing, he loves you. Uh, I remember his 